I introduce you to Jamie McClement, who's going to talk about canine osteoarthritis. Hi, hi. Can you? Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. I'm not that impressive yet. Listen to the talk first before you think it's good. <coughs> Can you all hear me? Good. And thank you all for coming. There's nothing worse than making a big entrance and finding your theatres empty. Um, I speak from experience. Right. Um, so I'm going to rush through this as quickly as I can. I did do a, a, a run through of this at an event in Bristol uh, last month, and it took five hours. So if I'm going too slow, just wave at me. Um, the machine works. Right. Who am I? Well, we've, we've done all this bit. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Uh, all my badges, because everyone loves a badge. And they said, include a, a photograph from your uh, academic career. So there you go, people. <laughs> so what we're going to be doing today, I mean, osteoarthritis in dogs, what are we going to learn about? You, you all know most of this. Um, it's, it's a fairly bizarre situation here, I think, in osteoarthritis in, in, in small animal practice, because it's something you all know really quite a lot about, but perhaps not quite enough to always give confident advice. So I'm hoping that actually very little of what I tell you is, is particularly new or new to you. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to tell you now that it's an interactive talk and you, anything like that. But as for last year, uh, if you do talk and say something sensible, you get chocolate. And because you asked me back, we've graduated from miniature heroes to M&S Swiss truffles. That's on you. So what I want to do today is just try and see, is there anything that I can talk about that might make life a bit easier for you when you're talking to your clients about what you need to do for arthritis in the dog. And this is in general practice. I'm trying to base everything I've got here on evidence-based medicine. I've got a fair few references in there. If you think I say something massively controversial, which unfortunately I do have a tendency to do, uh, wave your hand and shout nonsense or bullshit or something like that, and I'll see if I can justify it. So I'm going to skip through this mostly because uh, I don't want to waffle on and, and, and waste time that we don't have. You know all of this business. Um, I always used to get very confused about this, uh, this definition that it's uh, a non-inflammatory uh, joint disease. Don't get too tangled up in that. It's, it's a description everyone's moving away from. Of course there's inflammation in uh, osteoarthritis. We know that. That's why we give anti-inflammatories. But I think what is important is that we, we don't think of this as a, a cartilage disease. This is a disease of the whole joint, and not just the joint, um, but the tissues around it. And this is why it is more complex to deal with than we originally thought. It's always nice to think, can we have you know, one medication or one answer that's going to deal with this? And I think the reason we're seeing that's not the case is because many of our medications are dealing with one aspect of it. <coughs> so we're not just talking about one type of pain. We're talking about different phenotypes of pain, different areas of pain. So there's subchondral bone pain. There's muscle pain. Um, and think of it as just joint failure. You know, the medics get to have dramatic names like heart failure, kidney failure. So we'll call it joint failure. Um, I'm glad that my presentation's working. We had the usual terrifying moment of, of, of uh, um, IT stuff. So what does it look like? I mean, it, it, obviously it's very easy to see on radiography. When I was on this panel the other day, we were talking, should you say it must be diagnosed uh, radiographically? Well, I think that would be great, but sometimes it's not always appropriate. But but should be. I think it's something that we need to make sure that before we start all this stuff that I'm going to witter on about for the next uh, 40 minutes or whatever, that we know that we're actually starting in the right place. There's nothing worse than years and years of failing at arthritis management than to find out it was not that in the first place. Um, and this is what you're going to be seeing. Uh, we'll go through this nice and quickly because everyone here knows all about this. Um, sclerosis of the subchondral bone, I think, is something that perhaps people don't pick up on so much. Uh, so it's a whitening on, on, on x-ray, and it just shows that the bone is being asked to do things that it shouldn't normally be doing. So it's buttressing itself internally. Uh, this is something that does show up on, on x-ray, especially in the distal limb, um, and you can pick it up. Joint space narrowing, they always put in the textbooks, because in humans that's quite a big deal. Obviously there is really no joint space. The joint space is like a mo molecule thin layer of fluid. The space you're seeing is cartilage. So erosion of cartilage gives a narrow joint space. But in humans they can say, just hold your leg exactly like this and we can measure it. Dogs, it's not always so easy. And there's a, a nice picture of some really ugly joints. Here, a um, little more delicate, subchondral sclerosis here and an osteophyte here. This is why we do the flex view, looking for subtle changes in the elbow. Right. How do I see osteoarthritis? I, I'm a surgeon. I like things simple. There's lots of pictures you can, you can look at with all these Greek letters and, and pictures of the International Space Station and arrows and stuff. 
I see it more, more like this. This is what the body is trying to do. It's taking a joint that for some reason is not doing what it needs to and then taping it up. And as you go on, you need more and more and more tape. And you end up with this sort of picture. Now, not only does that mean that this machine doesn't work, trust me, when you try and drop someone off, you get quite a hostile internal environment. So it's really the joint trying to fix something up and failing in the long term. What does it look like in the dog? Dead easy. You know this. Thickened joints, reduced range of motion, crepitus, you know, well, sometimes. Stiffness, especially on rising after rest. Now, some of that stiffness, I agree, will be reduced range of motion, muscle stiffness, but the majority of it is pain. And I think this is the most important thing that we need to be aware of when we're talking about this with, with, with owners, is that this is not just stiffness, this is not oldness, this is pain that their animals are in. And they will always tell you they don't want their animal to be in pain. So, once we've made our putative diagnosis, we do have to exclude some differentials, because this is important. Neoplasia, obviously, dogs get bone tumours, they get other tumours, and that can cause pain in the limbs. Sepsis often is not really a differential, it's just something that you could miss on top of this. Arthritic joints have all this new bone laid down randomly, they've got really tortuous little blood vessels, so any circulating bacteremia, the, the bacteria will settle out in these joints. So this presents often almost like a fracture, you get a really painful dog with a really swollen joint. Um, so sepsis is something that's important. Then other times, if multiple joints are involved, inflammatory joint disease, uh, polyarthropathy is more important in dogs than rheumatoid arthritis, which is a big thing in humans. And infectious disease, which I always used to say was very rare in the UK, but luckily dog owners have found uh, some rich deposits of it in Romania and Cyprus, and they're mining it drastically uh, to bring it back. Why does it happen? Uh, it is not this. Dogs are well designed to run around in the park. They should be able to do this all their lives. This is something that is abnormal. It is a result of something abnormal. So it's either an abnormal loading of a normal joint, so yeah, deviation or obesity or overexercise, or it's a normal loading of an abnormal joint. So basically, something is up, and it's causing this. This is not something that just arises spontaneously. This is my rather <laughs> crappy surgeon version of the, uh, the complicated thing, but really it's more of a glossary. I'm not going to go too much into all these complicated arrows and, and lines and things. Um, but the basis is you get this inflammation, this synovitis that gets set up, and the synoviocytes will release these factors. Now, these are factors that are naturally occurring anyway. They're involved in, in sort of cartilage homeostasis but you're just pushing the balance too far towards degradation. And so you get these collagenases and things, and these will start eroding the surface of the cartilage. Not initially painful, because cartilage is a neural. But once it starts getting in deep, and you get your joint changes, then you get pain. Then you get bone-on-bone -bone contact. And then you're, you're quite far down the line. So these things then self-perpetuate, um, because the more of these inflammatory processes you get, the more cartilage erosion they get, you, the more joint changes you get. So you get even more of this because you've got a more abnormal joint. So it is really a bit of a snowball effect. Um, but that is what we are he here to deal with. My cousin's dog catching a snowball. Right. So presentation. Again, should be nice and straightforward. You know all of this. He's a little bit stiff when he gets up, but it soon wears off. So it's okay. Yeah. He's a bit slower on his walks. He just gets tired these days because he's old. So it's OK. No, we don't like that. And then the beauty, he's just getting old. It's nothing to worry about. Yeah, we don't like that. We don't like that at all. This is where education is so important because people can deal with their dog being stiff, but they can't deal with their dog being in pain. So often they will just tell themselves. And this is just raising awareness amongst the clients. So it can be quite difficult because when you confront a person and say, no, no, you're wrong, your dog's not just stiff and old, he's actually in pain, they can take that quite badly as though they're, they're doing things wrong or they don't care for their dog. So it is something that we, um, we, we need to try and bust through that barrier. But it is always worthwhile because if you think now, we've got animals that are alive and happy that even 10 years ago would have been euthanized a long, long time ago. And this is the goal. This is long-term happiness and reduction in pain. Right, so let's go on to the useful stuff, because you knew all of that. 
So diagnosis, obviously what we talked about, history is really important. Um, examination, observation is, is vital here. It's not just a case of waggling the joint and seeing if the dog squeaks. Be very careful with your, your examination, and I think this is something we can get better at. Make sure if you are going to manipulate a joint that you know you're exclusively manipulating that one joint. If you try and flex an elbow and you flex the shoulder, or you're bending the carpus, you can get yourself really quite confused. But observation is so important because you're watching the dog, if you can, get out of the car, not always, but certainly walking in that beautifully slippy waiting room that you all have. Uh, it's a real big show, because especially early on in the disease, one of the first things you'll see, apart from stiffness and getting up on that floor, is a little bit of proprioceptive change. <coughs> Investigation, we'll go through all this in a second. Uh, I've included arthroscopy, CT and MRI just as a little talking point, because obviously that's not going to be the first thing that you all do, and it might be a little over the top. Um, arthroscopy is very, very good at showing early cartilage changes, but you'd be fairly brave to, to, to launch straight into that. CT, MRI actually, because we know that radiographically, uh, the radiographic signs don't always follow with a good correlation the, the, uh, the progression of disease. MRI seems to, because it will show these little subchondral bone changes really, really early. However, I don't think, I'm not think for one minute you're going to be suggesting everyone should have an MRI every time their dog is a bit lame. Radiography is the way forward. No bi accurate biomarkers yet. A biomarker would be lovely. You know, you take a, a blood test and it says your dog has 18% arthritis and last year it had 16%, so it's, you know, we don't have that yet. So that would be something kind of along the lines of CRP. Hopefully we'll get one soon. Uh, I know everyone, very clever people, are doing a lot of work into that. But the most thing here is common bloody sense. You guys know this. The diagnosis, if you concentrate, you know, and you do a great job on that. Don't forget arthrocentesis. Uh, it will give you a, a firm diagnosis, but what it usually does even more so is um, rule out uh, differentials. So my main use there is, is this a really acute flare of osteoarthritis or is this a sepsis? And you can have a look under the, the microscope. Um, I, I do, and then I send it to a pathologist because, you know, I'm colorblind and a surgeon and always in a hurry. Um, but neutrophils suggest sepsis, and you'll see a lot of them in sepsis. And neutrophils uh, look like leopard spots, mononuclear cells look like cheetah spots. That's the way I remember it. Um, if you've got osteoarthritis, you'll have a few of these. If you've got sepsis, you're going to have an awful lot of these, and you can't mistake it for anything else. So it is worth a go. It does help. So this is really what I want to talk about, management, because this is an ongoing thing. And I think the main thing, obviously, that you know is that it's got to be multimodal. This isn't something where you can say, day one, here's your arthritis tablet, that's you for life, job done, we're all good. It involves a multimodal pool of drugs, but also kind of a multimodal team of people doing different things. And the better we can make use of that, then the better the outcome is going to be for these animals. First of all, it's good if we can prevent it. Second, we need to educate it, educate the owner. Um, I think the first thing we've got to do is just explain to them what they're expecting. What are you expecting? Because the, the headline is, is actually not that great. And I think if we don't put this in, people then have false expectations and get a bit narky with us. You know, the headline act is this is a degenerative disease. It is progressive. It is incurable. It will cause your dog pain. And unless something else ghastly happens, it will be the end of your dog. But the good news is that we can do a lot about it to prevent all that happening or slow it down. So it is important they understand what we're trying to do here. We're not curing this. We're trying to make it better and try and slow it down. When they say, I don't want my animal to be in pain, you have to just say, well, no, that's the aim. I think the chances of getting completely pain-free forever are pretty minimal, but we're working towards it, just so they understand that we're all on the same page. Monitoring is vital. And we'll get into this, because this is something that I think is, is slightly difficult in first opinion practice, and all these things that people come up with of good ways to monitor osteoarthritis are perhaps a little unrealistic in your, your regular consults and treat. And then salvage if, if we, we get a bit stuck. So preventative, deal with the cause. If you know there's something that's going on that is going to lead to osteoarthritis, try and get in there early, as early as possible. So cruciate surgery, good articular fracture repair, or these osteotomies to try and, and improve joint loading um, for your abnormal loading or your abnormal joints. Weight management is crucial, and we'll come back to that later. And then breeding programs, obviously they are preventative. If you can avoid 
having these abnormal animals, then they're, they're not going to get abnormal joints. Um, I put this in. I thought this was really cool because he lost all this weight. Then I read the word before. So actually, <laughs> this is a really bad slide. So, so sorry about that. Right. Take time to explain what's going on. I think this is, this is something that we don't, we don't always do very well. You know, we get the dog in, we do our diagnostics, and then we say to the owner, perhaps over the phone, hey, it's got arthritis, that's great, and then leave it at that. And this is where they often go to other sources to try and get information. We really need, and I think we've kind of, we've kind of dropped the ball on this a little bit, we need to be the ones that give the best information, the most confident information to these owners. Because this is why they go off looking at some of these weird people on, on, online, is because they just want information. The expected outcomes we've gone across, you know this is going to progress, and you know that it's going to get worse, but you just need to try and do your best to, to, to deal with it and improve the quality of life of the dog. Make a plan. What should they do? You've got to involve the owner. The more involved they are, the more they're on your side, and the better the outcome's going to be, the happier the client's going to be. And this, be available, be the source of good advice. I know how difficult this is. Someone's called, their dog is perhaps 1% lamer than it was last month, can you speak to them? Not always easy, but this is the important thing. It's a long-term thing, it's a long-term relationship with this owner. And if they are going to go online, I'm just going to give a special mention to Canine Arthritis Management. You can find them on Facebook, they're brilliant for clients. The other thing as well is you often see this pattern. I mean, you, you know that so many times the animal has a condition that the owner has. And it's so easy to take this shortcut. If the owner has osteoarthritis, well, what do you do? Oh, I put a heat bag on my leg if, you know, it's, it's a cold, wet morning. Does it make you feel better? Yeah, okay, I'll do it with the dog. How much do you exercise? Well, I don't play football anymore, but do you sit on the couch all day? No, because then I get stiff. Well, same for the dog. So it's a very useful resource there. This is where I think, it, this is what's getting important though. Who is actually in charge? Because I think there's kind of a big disconnect between there's, there's so much cool research going on in arthritis management. But does it actually get from the research through to the clinician, through to the owner, through to the dog? I think that's where the big disconnect is. So is it specialists that are in charge? Or well, possibly, because they do you know, a lot of the research work. But specialists who? Is this, is this an, an orthopedic condition? Or is this a pain management uh, anesthesia and analgesia condition? It's a bit tricky. It kind of falls between. Is it GP vets? Well, you do a lot of the management. You do far more, probably, than, than, than I do. Uh, you do this every day. Um, so it could be you. You guys issue the medications, you do the consults, you do the rechecks. Is it the nurses? Well, the nurses actually are really useful at this. This is something they're good at. They get on this. They do the weight management. They talk to the owners. Uh, they listen to the owners um, because they've got more time and generally they're, they're not sort of a bit manic like I am. Or is it the owners? Well, the owners are the ones actually giving the medication. They're with the animal every day. They're watching it. They're the source of information that you have when the animal comes in for its recheck. So maybe it's them. They're making decisions. This isn't working. Should we change this? Can we do a bit more? Or is it that? Hey, is this why owners do weird things? This was some random guy I saw in London. Why is it that they, they turn to Facebook for this particular condition? You don't see this with, what are the other things people have, like Cushing's disease in the dog? You know, Cushing's disease, people don't just say, oh, my vet diagnosed Cushing's, I didn't listen to them, I went online, I found you can give it honey, or something like that. So why is it specifically this condition? Is it because somewhere things are getting lost? What is it they're trying to find online? It could be this, yeah. Uh, you know, the big free thing that will cure this. I, you know, it would be lovely, wouldn't it? I don't think it is. You know, you don't have people like Elanco quaking in their boots, I hope they don't discover that it's Brussels sprouts. No one tell them it's Brussels sprouts. It's not that. They would love it if that was the case. I think it's more this, because they want confident advice on what they should do for their pet. They want confidence. They don't know what they should do. I actually had a moment like this a couple of days ago. I have a new pup, uh, a whippet, and he keeps, we've got a small garden, and he keeps running into the fence. He's desperate to run. So I thought, right, his vaccinations are finished. I'll take him to the park. I can let him run off the lead. And I got to the park, and I thought, or should I? What if he buggers off? What if he runs in front of a car? What should I do? So what I did, well, I don't know, I worried about it for a bit. Then I thought, okay, it's great, I'll ask a vet. Where's the nearest one? Well, she was standing right next to me, very lucky. But I, I know what they, they think. We didn't let him off the lead in the end, and he's still alive, it's great. Um, what people do is they want someone just to say confidently, this is what you should do. I recommend this. I know you're worried about your dog, so I recommend you should do this. 
They don't just want a list. You could do this, you could do this, you could do this. Well, I don't know. That's not what they want. And unfortunately, this is what we see a lot of. Uh, I like this, except for the, the bad spelling. But here, confidence versus knowledge. So I think most vets are probably about here. I get to about here, I think, where I, I feel like I know what I'm doing with this condition until I stand in front of a room of people and think, oh my god, what if someone calls me out? What if they're an expert? But unfortunately, a lot of the people on Facebook kind of sail in the Mabrida Triangle here of um, confidently saying, oh, you should do this. We've had some great results. Oh my god, those words. Purely anecdotal. Or they're trying to sell something. Let's be honest. And they do not know anything like as much as you. But people believe them because they say it confidently. Important point. Monitor. Osteoarthritis is progressive. We know that. So it will change. Do we remember that? This is so important. And I, I look at histories when I'm you know, getting referral cases. Dogs with osteoarthritis. And what I see a lot of is it comes in for its six-month arthritis check. And the outcome is doing OK on Prevacox. That's it. No indication of, it, is it more lame or less lame? Which leg is it lame on? Which joint is affected? Does the only thing they're better? Does the only thing they're worse? No, it's doing okay. Well, I'll give you a big clue. Dogs tend to do okay, unless they're dying. Dogs are tough. They, you know, whatever you give them, they're going to see the bunny rabbits and the sunshine. And unless what they've got is imminently fatal, they're going to put a brave face on it. So they will be doing okay. But okay isn't always good enough. And is it okayer than last time? And you look at you know, humans with this as well. People with osteoarthritis, they're, they're tough. They get used to this. My old gran, she had rheumatoid arthritis for all of her life. And she didn't walk down the street going, ow, 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 or complaining. No, she got on with it. So she was doing OK. But I think she was in a lot of pain. So it's so important that we monitor what's going on. You can't advise if you don't observe. So you have to make sure not only do you observe what's happening, but you record what's happening. So next time, you can remind yourself. So this is so important. And I know these days it's very difficult because we often have poor case continuity, and that's no one's fault. You know, we're in bigger companies, we're in bigger practices. Ideally, you want to form that strong relationship. But if you can't, or your memory is a little dodgy, like mine, it's so important just to write things down. Even just which leg it is, which joint it is, how lame. And you'll find your life easier the next year. <coughs> Get the history from everyone involved, everyone. Everyone. First of all, the person that brings the dog. Ideally, the quiet one who stands behind them who's not allowed to talk. They're often a mine of information. But then also things like um, those nice reports you get back from hydrotherapy. Yeah, I know what happens to those. Yeah, well done. Hydrotherapy report. But it's so much useful information. They're putting on muscle. They're not. They're losing muscle. They're getting better. They're not getting better. This is so much information for you guys. It doesn't take long to read. So it's getting that history from everybody involved. Proper examination. And this is, I know, where this gets difficult, because they come in for their 15-minute consult. OK, so you have to do the booster. OK, so you have to talk about insurance. You have to listen to the dog's heart. You have to talk about its adrenal glands or some rubbish like that, uh, worming, all this. And it gets a bit lost. So it's very easy just to look at the dog and say, well, OK, he was a bit creaky walking in. He's doing OK. This is what's going on. You are the captain of the team. There's lots of players on this team. But you have to get them all together. You're the guy who knows. So it's you that makes sure we understand what is relevant, what is important, what is not. And then you give that information back to the client in a way that they can understand. And dedicate time. Now, I know pretty much every lecture you're going to go to today, someone's going to say, this is the most important thing you'll talk about in this consult. And I realize that there's a lot of other stuff that goes on. But it, in an arthritic dog, no matter what else is going on, this is really important. And we know that owners, owners want this. Um, because why? I mean, they, well, they're going out spending money on magnetic collars. So don't worry about this being a waste of money. I think what we worry about is, if I charge them for it, are they going to think, well, at the moment, what happens is they turn up for their six-month re review. You spend half of it taking a blood test of the dog. And then you tell them you're doing OK, carry on with the same drugs. And you do this in 10 minutes because it's a good way to catch up. Yeah, if I was the client, I'd be upset about that. I don't think that's a good use of money. However, however, what if the client said to you, I know this is important. I do. I see you don't have time to go through all this right now in this booster vaccination. 
Would it be possible if you could book me another appointment just to talk about arthritis? I will pay whatever it is, 30 quid. It will be a good investment for the next six months. I think there's a fair proportion who would, but they're probably too polite to say it because this is Britain. So what if you offer it? Worst is it's taken another 10 seconds out of your, your short consult and they say no, God's sake no. But a lot of people would. Let's just talk about this. And this is what we lose out on as vets, is just this time to talk. So I think it's worth just asking, especially these involved arthritis clients, do you want that? And you can do it properly. And I'm going to also talk about loading codes, just a fraction, because this, I know whenever someone puts a, a nice big form in front of you and says, you should do this, and you just think, my God, I haven't got time for that. But this one is beautiful. Why? Because this one is done in the waiting room. This one essentially gives you a beautiful, a beautiful bit of information. It's not too complicated. I think it only runs to like two, two sides of the page. The owner fills it in, and it gives you a score, which you can then measure against next year. The important thing is they don't know what they wrote last year. You don't remind them. So this is something they can turn up in the room and say, there, look, there's the score. You add it up. And you can see it's objective. Also, Coast allows you to stage it. So, so load is for the owner. Coast is for you and the owner. Um, so this is just a good thing. But also, I mean, you can do your own thing. Even if everyone did, is the dog lame? Which leg? Which joint? Out of five, how lame? Then next year, you can see and you can, you can make your relevant decisions on that. So it is so important that we are objective about this. Unfortunately, it's not like heart failure where you can measure heart rate or something like this. It is more difficult. And use videos as well. I'm halfway, aren't I? My God, OK. Uh, video phones are fantastic, because the dog, it's always a good day. When they come in, oh, yeah, he's usually worse than this, but this is a good day. Yeah, because he's full of adrenaline. He wants to be up and at it. So get them to bring videos of a good day and a bad day, just in case the dog is doing the other one. So treatment. Palliative treatment is essentially what the mainstay of all this is. Non-steroidals are just so important. And I, I've noticed a bit of a fear of non-steroidals creeping in. I see in the last two or three years, vets are prescribing them a little less. I don't quite know why. I know our owners are upset because they, they, they're worried this is going to harm their dog in some way. But non-steroidals are fantastic. If they invented them today, we would be so excited. This talk has been brought to you by the power of non-steroidals and the letters M-A-N-F-L-U, because I felt a bit sick yesterday. They're good drugs. You know, if you have a headache, this is what you reach for. Okay, you drink more fluids, but you go for a non-steroidal, because they're good. They take away pain. Occasionally, they get side effects. Not often. Think how many non-steroidals we give out, and how many of these dogs actually have proper issues with them. Nutraceuticals, physiotherapy, this is really important, and this is super important. So I think what we have to do with this is, is think of all these things that we can do to make the dog better. It's not that we do one to exclusion, and then if that's not working, we failed. To use the next one is an admission of failure. This is just the whole thing in our armory. We've got to do this as best as possible. So I think also another thing, I don't like that word, palliative. Firstly, because for me it sounds a bit negative, but to owners it means one thing. Palliative for them is end of life care. And this is not end of life. There's a lot of life left. Proactive, proactive treatment. So, medications. This is what you all want to hear about. Okay, this is my attempt at science. Uh, I've kept it simple. I'm going to say it's for you, but actually it's for me. Um, when I gave this slide to, to Alanco, they, they doctored a bit and I got a bit confused. But this is just broadly so we can get an understanding of what goes on. So this is the, the, sort of the inflammatory cascade that we're talking about with osteoarthritis. And you, you know about these, these two um, isomers of, of, of cyclooxygenase. So here, we call it the arachidonic acid pathway just because that's the name everyone pulled out of anywhere. Here is where non-selective non-steroidals will work. Who can tell me a non-selective non-steroidal? No, no, that's more selective. Aspirin. Who said aspirin? Truffle, truffle. There you go. Absolutely, aspirin. So what does that mean? It means very, very good effect. Aspirin is, is a very good non-steroidal. However, poor safety margin, side effects. So that's that, where that one is. This up here is steroids. So this one, OK, you get some effect, poor effect, but you get a lot of side effects. You're wiping out quite a lot of important stuff. Selective non-steroidals. This is things like Metacam, Prevacox even. Um, and then further down the line here, once you get into your prostaglandin chain ways, you get several prostaglandin. I've only put one in because it's, it's the one that's relevant. Several prostaglandin chains. This one here through the EP4 receptor is where galaprant 
uh, works. Now, this is the one which is mostly involved with the inflammation around uh, osteoarthritis. So this should be the perfect drug. Well, it's not quite, because this is biology. So there is some overlap. Because ideally, this would be completely eradicating inflammation related to osteoarthritis with no side effects. So it's not quite, but it's pretty good at a certain thing. And we'll talk about that now. So galaprant is new. It's highly, highly selective to this area of, of the pathway. So more targeted prevention of inflammation. Less se severe side effects. No, mum, I don't mean fewer. I mean that they are they're less severe, not that there are fewer of them. Safer. I think the important thing with galaprant, because I've heard some people saying they're not so happy with it, and I think they're perhaps not using it exactly correctly. It's not designed that you have an animal that for years has been on non-steroidals and not done well, and you need a better one. That's not what it's about. You don't say, the dog's not doing well on Prevacox, so I'm going to change it to galaprant for it to be better. That's why people are not getting on with it. This is the one where you say this is more confidence that this is going to be a safer drug. So this is the one where people say, is this dog too young? to put it on non-steroidals for so long. That's what it's for, early start. Or dogs who have issues with other non-steroidals. But it does have a silly name. I mean, what went wrong with naming drugs these days? To me, it sounds like a, like a, a Randy Brewster. I mean, when I started, all you had was Xenocarp. Xenocarp's like a superhero of pain. And then they changed it to Rimadyl, which sounds like something you wear to go Morris dancing. I don't know. Um, yeah. Samaljex, he just reminds me of that guy with the harp in Asterix. I don't know. Anyway. Uh, how do we use non-steroidals? Long-term or pulse? Oh, well, let's have a show of hands. When you're, you're using, who, use, who uses pulses of non-steroidals? Couple. So I think the logic there is if the, the, the animal only has occasional bouts of pain, you can treat them occasionally with non-steroidals. And I see that. But I, I remember this thing, I don't really watch Top Gear, but I watched it once and Jackie Stewart was on it. And he said, when you come out of a corner, don't put your foot down on the accelerator until you know you're not going to take it off again. And that kind of sticks with me. If this animal is showing lameness due to osteoarthritis, then he has osteoarthritis and you're just seeing the peaks. Therefore, he has inflammation. So for me, once I'm happy that the dog has osteoarthritis, I want it on long-term anti-inflammatories if I can. There's got to be a damn good reason not to. Because as well as the, the, the analgesic effect, we've got the anti-inflammatory effect in that joint, in the synovitis. So for me, I'm not a huge fan of pulse. Full dose or taper? Uh, I think this is kind of a trick question, because you want to give the minimum effective dose. So I guess tapering works fine. But I just have this horror of dogs that come in on half dose of Metacam and lame. What have you achieved there? You've got the downside of you're giving it a drug and it's in pain. So if you're going to taper the dose, do, do stop once you get to the, the lowest effective dose. Don't just keep going on and do it slowly and watch for the answers. Observe. Blood tests. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky. So how often do we do blood tests? Well, every six months? Every 12 months? Who said that? Who said that? Ah, hey, truffle. <laughs> Depends on the patient. Yeah, yeah, sure. Because if you've got a dog that, say, we diagnose at, at one year old that it's got um, osteoarthritis of the elbow, and by the time it's 10, we've spent all the client's budget doing blood tests every six months, and then it gets bad, we haven't really succeeded. This dog was perfectly well. I think also what we need to be sure of is what message the owner gets from this. Your dog needs blood tests because it's on anti-inflammatories. Why? 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 In case it's damaging your dog? No, it's in case there's another problem that means the dog can't take these. But we, we don't quite get that message across. So we're actually adding to the fear that the owner has of this drug. Oh my God, he says, I've got to check it up and have blood tests every six months. This sounds dangerous. And we tell them, yeah, if it vomits, bring this. If it, da, da. So actually, we, we're, we're kind of reinforcing this. <coughs> right, other pain relief. Oh dear. So these are the exciting drugs that everyone gets most excited about. So... Let's go down here. First of all, a CRI is very, very useful in an acute flare. Um, and we'll go into why in a second. But obviously, it's not something you can do at home. So when you get breakthrough pain from your anti-inflammatory, from your non-steroidal, you hear often that the dog does well on the anti-inflammatory, but eventually it stops working. Yeah, crap. That's not true. These drugs don't stop working. If you have a, a headache, you take a paracetamol or, or, or an ibuprofen. 
if you've still got a headache, it doesn't mean ibuprofen doesn't work. It just means you've got a really bad hangover. And it's the same with these drugs. The drug hasn't stopped working. The arthritis has just got worse. The phenotype of pain has got worse. So you continue giving it, if you can, but then you need to add something. So tramadol became massively fashionable lately. Uh, I never really got on with it. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, uh, without going into too much waffle, the tramadol gets more useful as you break it down into metabolites. And in dogs, the most active metabolite isn't that much of the proportion of the ones that we've got. The other thing is dogs break it down much faster. So the half-life in humans and cats is about six hours. And in dogs, it's, I think, one and a half to, to 1.7. So actually, if you're going to give continuous pain management with tramadol, you're probably going to have to be giving it six to eight times a day, which is a little unrealistic. And it's an awful lot of an opioid to give to an owner to walk out of the door with. I get a bit funny about that. So I tend to use these. Um, and we'll talk about them in a second. This is my favorite, amantadine. And if that doesn't work, I go with gabapentin. Paracetamol, yeah, it, 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 it's a funny drug because it's more of an analgesic. It's not really an anti-inflammatory, but it does have some use. Always with these drugs, I question if the dog needs more drugs, does it actually need more drugs or is it something else that we can change earlier? So when I see these dogs coming in on like all of these, I get a little worried that people actually haven't caught up so much with what's going on with the dog. So I don't use tramadol. Uh, this was a nice paper saying, really, there's not much evidence for it in long-term chronic pain management, so I don't use it. The others, definitely, I do. Mm. So chronic pain. Chronic pain is so important in osteoarthritis. Acute pain, we know. What's acute pain for? Acute pain is you've got a bad joint. Don't put your weight on it because you'll damage it more. But chronic pain is this extra pain that we get that has no physiological reason. It doesn't help. It, it just makes things worse and worse, and it's just winding it up. So this is where your amantadine, um, which is an NDMA antagonist, will, will help because you get these changes in the dorsal horn of the spine, which give you this hyperalgesia and then uh, uh, allodynia, where things get magnified. This dog has more pain than it used to, even though it's got the same disease. So this is where amantadine is very useful because it'll be more effective at dealing with that specific pain than the anti-inflammatory. It's not so good at dealing with acute pain, which is why you don't use it on your own. Okay? So it should work on top of a non-steroidal. Um, so what you're trying to do is return it to a dog with acute pain. And that's where CRIs of ketamine and things can help as well. They just <coughs> unwind it. Important point is this. Don't let your clients be scared of medication. It's not an admission of defeat. It's not dragging things out. Basically, if the dog is happy, I don't care if they rattle. If they're happy, that's what we're trying to achieve. Drugs are important. Nutraceuticals, controversy. Um, are they effective? Well, it depends on the nutraceutical. It depends what you're doing, possibly. This is where it gets a bit woolly, and this is where I think we need to be a bit stronger with our advice. Give them some information, but I'm going to come to the way I advise on this in a minute. Um, but we'll talk about some specific ones. Basically, what you're trying to do is balance the amount of benefit that the owner is going to get versus the costs. And when I say costs, just for information in this talk, I'm talking about not just monetary costs, which are important, but also impact on the dog, impact on lifestyle, uh, side effects. Um, so here's a nice review. Uh, high level of comfort, strong evidence for non-steroidals. Yeah, we know that. Um, these ones in the middle, green lip muscle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Moderate. And then weak for these things. Weak. And this is one that's, that's very fashionable at the moment. Extract of turmeric. Because it's proven to be, it has anti-inflammatory properties. Yes, it does. It does have anti-inflammatory properties. But you have to give a lot. And how do you get that into your dog at effective levels? And what does that cost the owner? And how much are they worrying about it? It's, it's just a big deal. Um, here we go. Now, this is the other thing that's hugely important about, about uh, these nutraceuticals, is a uh, placebo effect. It's massive. You still get people saying animals can't have a placebo effect. They don't know what's going on. But we know they do. When you look at the, um, the papers that, that confirm things like non-steroidals work, so the ones that they're using to justify their use, 45%, I think it was, improved on, on carprofen. But 26% of the placebo group improved. So owners will pick up on this. They give something to their dog, and they think it's better, because this waxes and wanes. But also, they've invested in it. They want to see improvement. So what? Owners are stupid. Well, maybe. No. Vets, too. And double-blinded studies, too. Because some dogs improve, no matter what you do. So you have to watch out. This is why anecdotal evidence is not always so useful. So here we have the pyramid of evidence. Oh, my god. Um, this is so important. This is anecdotal evidence. 
This is uh, double-blinded studies, and this is systematic reviews, where they find all these good studies, and then they compare them. It's so important that we do this. This is the kind of thing we want. So I was just thinking of pyramids, so I went all Egyptian. Um, so, yes, well done, well done. What did you find? Yes, good. No, no. And basically, call me old-fashioned, but unless your supervisor is a baboon crowned by the sun with a 50 mil syringe, uh, it's not science to me. Well done, Anubis. We like it. However, down at the bottom, you get this. Background information. Oh, yeah, well, my aunt, she tried the blueberries and whatever. No, no. We've had some great results. How many great results? What happened to the other animals? How good? No. I don't like it. It's bad. Okay? And we have to be responsible for that too. Oh, I gave this dog uh, those injections. What are they called? The pentasan stuff. No. No, 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 no. Watch what's going on. I ate blueberries, my tumour went away. Well, yeah, well, that was in between your chemotherapy sessions. Mm. <laughs> right. A diet with added EPA and all these things. It was a good study, but I suppose a bit vague. because Duncan Lascelles is awesome, by the way. Read anything he writes. Uh, modest improvement. Well, modest is actually quite good. We like that. This is just by changing the, 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 the food. Um, so EPA, yes. Omega-3 EPA, yes, it's good. If they want to give something... That's a very good thing to give. Um, EPA is uh, a fatty acid. And basically what it does is it competes. You remember that, that picture I showed you with the arachidonic acid? It competes there in, in the cell membrane. And again, um, produces less inflammatory products. And yes, mum, again, I mean less inflammatory, not fewer. So you just get less inflammation going on. So there is science behind this. Um, but you need a lot. You do need a lot. And this is where I think we have to give, a, give, give good advice here. So uh, omega-3, good. Uh, found in fish oils. You can also get it from plants. It's a bit more bioavailable from fish, but you have to kill all the fish. green lip muscle extract contains ETA, which is pretty similar to EPA, so that's why that works. Um, and also you can get synthetic ones like Antonol, which means that you don't have to kill all the muscles and the Belgians don't get upset. So uh, here's a good quote. To match JD, I like JD. I'm not paid by them or anything. I just think it's very, very good. A uh, 30 kilo Labrador would need 70 to 100 supplements every day. Into articula uh, articular treatments. Steroids, uh, we've always been scared of steroids because uh, they have chondrodestructive um, effects uh, and also you risk introducing infection. However, it's end stage. So I suppose if you've got one joint that's really, really bad and the rest of the dog is okay, first of all, there's going to be no cartilage left in, so don't worry about the chondrocytes. So it's, it's, it's not a bad thing. Okay, but it's, it's very low on my list. PRP and stem cells. This is where it gets a bit exciting and also confusing. So, first of all, stem cells. Everyone knows about stem cells, I'm sure. The idea was these cells are, are pluripotent, so they can, they can turn into any tissue in the body, or mesenchymal ones can turn into any connective tissue. So if we take a damaged joint and put stem cells in, will it fix all those problems? Well, it didn't turn out like that, unfortunately, because that would have been cool. But it does it does modulate the inflammatory process in that joint. So they are useful, and they've been shown to act. Stem cell injection has been shown in one study to be superior to PRP, okay, one study, but it does usually involve more than one anesthetic or sedation. So often these are old dogs. Also, I think what's really important, first of all, only one ever showed any structural regeneration, um, which I think is important. So regenerative medicine at the moment is perhaps a, a big word. Maybe in things like uh, ligament tendon injuries, yes. Um, but what are you actually getting in your syringe? And this is where we're in the Wild West at the moment because you don't know. You don't know. There's no consistency. Uh, you could be getting a very good product with exactly the right number of stem cells. Uh, you might not. You might get none. Also, how many stem cells do we need? Um, over 30, you start to get necrosis. Under this, you're probably not going to get too much effect. So if we can make it regulated, I think we'll start to see good information. And it's the future. Definitely it's the future. We just need to work out how best to use it. I'm a little cautious about just whacking it into arthritic joints in general and hoping they get better, because it's only temporary. So I think more to come from this, definitely. Um, a measure benefits versus cost, because if an injection is going to cost them, I don't know, two grand? That's quite a lot. Is there something else you could be doing? But it is the future. Right, physical therapies. Are we running short of time here? Another 10 minutes, okay. So, this is so important because it does help. Non-pharmacological methods of improving treatment. So, these things are just so important. Firstly, because they are important and they help. So there's that study, at, was it Liverpool, where they, they, they worked out that shifting 
the excess weight of a dog with arthritis was equivalent to the non-steroidal effect. Obese dogs are not going to get better with all these medications. But this is something that the, the owners can do at home, and it involves them, and it makes them part of the team, and it gets them on side. You know, you saying, I want you to have a 2,000 pound stem cell injection versus I want you to put rubber mats down so your dog doesn't slip. They'll go with that. Lose weight, feed it less dog food. It's actually saving you money. So either at home, in the clinic, or by a physiotherapist, or a physiotherapist in the clinic. So this is where it's good for you to make a network, and it's good for you to be involved. It's OK, it's OK to say, for once, I'm not the one who knows the most about this. The physiotherapist might well be. You don't have to tell them, do this exercise, or the hydrotherapist, heat the water to this temperature, or whatever. You just have to say to them, what I want. There's muscle loss here. Can you build it up? And then listen to them when they talk back to you. Check which, hydro which hydrotherapist or physiotherapist they're using. Because if you don't know, you can't recommend. They might be good, they might not be. Regulation of these people is, is really a bit hit and miss. You know, for someone like a hydrotherapy physiotherapy center, you could have someone like, uh, uh, is it NAVP, where you have to have a human degree in physiotherapy and then an animal conversion course postgraduate. That person is going to know a lot. But then the other person called veterinary physiotherapist is someone that just thought that might be fun. And when you look at hydrotherapy centers, you know, ones that actually someone in the center has a qualification in hydrotherapy. High in centers associated with veterinary clinics, uh, like 70%, in ones associated with boarding kennels down to about 18%. People have no qualifications. They just have a pool. So it's important that you, you don't have to do it, but you have to know where they're going. Because I think that hydrotherapy, physiotherapy are kind of vet-driven after surgery. You've had surgery, go and see a hydrotherapist. But in osteoarthritis, it's often client-driven. Can I see a hydrotherapist? So this, is, again, is where you can give advice. This is a good one. They're close. Or this is a good one. They're not close, but they're better than the close one. I, I have a relationship with them. I understand that they're good. I know what they're talking about. So it's your job to get involved with them there. Often, though, methods are extrapolated from human data because it's really, really hard to work this out in dogs. Um, you know, we can say from humans, I have a bad leg. The massage makes it feel better. Great. Uh, you know, in humans, got to, they, they basically say after years of study, pain is what the patient says it is. OK, subjective. So in animals, pain, they don't speak. They don't speak English. Pain is what we believe the dog would say it was if it could talk. Complex. So in humans, you can just do this. And we've been doing these things like massage and, and heat packs for thousands of years. Um, and they're actually cleverer than we thought. We're using override systems. The override system a dog does when he's got arthritis, but he sees a bunny rabbit, so he can run. We're tricking the body into that. Um, extrapolated from human data, dogs tolerate some things. Does that mean it works? Or possibly. You know, if you put a heat pack on a dog with a sore joint, they like it. But then my dog, you know, he would tolerate being dressed as a baby and put in a pushchair. And I don't think we can extrapolate benefit from that. This is important. Avoid sedentary lifestyle, OK? If they lie down on the floor, all day, they will get worse. If they lie down on the floor all week and then go up a mountain at the weekend, they will get worse. They need to be doing some exercise. 10 minutes on the lead is nothing for a dog. A dog should run all day. But 10 minutes on the lead is infinitely better than no minutes on the lead. You've got to get them moving, otherwise these joints will seize up. So heat therapy, heat packs, uh, excellent. You know, if, almost for free. They can give them a hot water bottle or something. And what you're doing there is you've got your chronic pain fibers, and then you've got your faster fibers. And if you, if you stimulate those, they can almost override this, this chronic pain setup. So it is this tricking this body into the override system. So it's actually a lot cleverer than people thought. Um, laser and therapeutic ultrasound really are posh heat packs that penetrate deeper. So that's what they're doing. I mean, they're good. Uh, whether one can justify the investment in a normal practice, if you can do enough to get the benefit from them, no. I mean, if you think about the difference, it'll be better than using a heat pack, but it'll also be thousands of times more expensive. So have a think about that. Ice pack, you're, you're doing local, um, uh, kind of like a local, local neuralgia. Um, you're reducing uh, the, the effect of the nerves. So you're basically numbing the area. So it's good. So if they hurt themselves, do this. If they've just got an arthritic joint, do this. Massage, everyone knows massage is nice. Um, hydrotherapy. Hydrotherapy is really good because it's low impact exercise. But also, you've got to think which one to use. There's pools, there's treadmills. Pools will increase flexion, and treadmills will increase extension. We never thought of that. That's why you choose. Okay? Your hydrotherapist might be better off to choose than you if you give them the information about the dog. And shockwave therapy. Um, shockwave therapy may be for end stage, you know, a shockwave unit. 
a decent one is well over 10 grand. Um, and the dog needs to be a bit sedated. So uh, my view on this is start with the basics, but these will help. And the owners can do these as well. Or they can go and do these with someone who's got time to listen and massage their dog and make it feel better. And then the owner feels better as well. And then at the end, salvage treatment. So uh, if you say, do you know what, this joint is so failed that this joint is making this dog, and whatever I do, the dog has a bad quality of life. Well, let's get rid of the joint, not get rid of the dog. Um, so things like hip replacement. Hip replacement is like non-steroidals. Don't do it if you don't need to. But as soon as you work out that you're going to need to, get it done. Because it'll outlast a dog. Because dogs' hips are, are, are well designed, unlike ours. This is why implants wear out in humans and they don't in dogs. So put them in early. If you've got a dog at the age of, of one who can't run without pain, that's a lot of life he's got where he could be pain-free. <coughs> so salvage. When? Uh, yeah, so here are, here are different types of one. I mean, you know all of these. Joint replacement, um, resurfacing, all these things where you're basically taking this, this rubbish joint. Um, we don't have time to talk about prostheses. That's a whole other talk. Uh, and that's a bad picture of a cool surgery. When? As soon as it apparently necessary. As soon as you're saying, you're not giving up, you're just saying, do you know what, I've done all the sensible things and it's not worked and your dog's still in pain. Let's just get rid of the joint. It's not helping. It's like a tikka. You've got an ear that is deaf and is painful. Let's just do without. Future options. This is where it gets exciting, people. Arthritis is always exciting. Nerve growth factor. So I think uh, John Innes will be talking about this later. If he's not talking about that, I have no idea what he's talking about. So they developed this, and this is going to be released. Anti-nerve growth factor monoclonal antibody injection. So nerve growth factor is uh, a physiological thing. It, it, it's there to involve um, maintenance of your, your nervous system and growth of your nervous system when you're young. However, it also has an effect of um, sensitizing your nerves in chronic pain. So they've developed this, this drug, which is a monoclonal antibody against it. Now, in human trials, there were some hiccups. In human trials, again, it came out equivalent in effectiveness to non-steroidals in management of pain. One monthly injections. It's called tanezumab, um, interestingly named after the Aztec god of, of desperation in Scrabble, I think. But uh, this, is, this is the future. Um, now, you never know how good a drug's going to be until you actually see it out in, in the open. But I think this is going to be massive for dogs that can't take non-steroidals or dogs that are taking non-steroidals but have breakthrough pain. They have had some problems in humans using it alongside non-steroidals, um, but without getting into it too in depth, it's not problems we tend to see in dogs anyway. So we might be able to use them together. So look, watch out for that. Um, advances in regenerative modalities. I, I don't know whether it's going to be advances in the modalities. I think it's going to be better regulation, better products, and us knowing better where to use them. So this is definitely going to be the future. I mean, I think one thing that we can get to is, is um, does it have to actually be the stem cells from that dog? Theoretically, no. The only study I could find says that maybe they're slightly less effective than an autograft, but we could have a, a tissue bank. So you don't have to anesthetize these dogs to take the fat out and put them back in. So maybe that will be an advance. You can just get these things off the shelf. Gene therapy, maybe. I was getting a bit excited at this stage. Um, and I think we're going to get more of these things like this at, at a molecular level, in the joint, more physiological, and trying to prevent some of these, these, um, these pathways. So I think it's going to be exciting the next five years. We're going to have a lot more to play with. But then the last 10 years has been superbly exciting as well. Because back in the day, I mean, the reason I got into osteoarthritis was as a first opinion clinician. When they used to bring you in those dogs on a sheet, he's gone off his back legs, he needs to be put to sleep. And you give it one shot of Xenocarp and the next day it's, it's walking around wagging its tail. It's magic. So anyway, this is what the whole thing is supposed to be about. I thought, can I just give you a slide that tells you how I talk to people about this stuff? Let's keep it simple. Um, and I, I was very proud of this because I, I thought I'll do it like a pyramid and I'll put all the lines in it and I'll, it's so clever. And I went to do a talk with uh, one of the CAM, the canine arthritis nurses, and she had the, exactly the same slide, so I felt a bit, a bit useless. I've called it input value coefficient because it's basically seeing input versus, versus the downside. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I was going to call it cost versus success, but cost sounds a bit mercenary. I think IVC sounds better than CVS. So, here we go. <laughs> Just saying. 
correct early diagnosis. And what, what's going on is pyramid is basically saying this is the foundation. Until you've done this, don't move on to the next stage. And if you go up a stage and it's not working, just slide down on your ass like when you're skiing and do the stage below. If we don't know what we're dealing with, we can't give good advice, we can't treat. Correct diagnosis early, early as possible. Owner education, unless they know what's going on and what we're trying to achieve and what this disease is, they're not going to, you know, these people that come in and say, oh, you gave me the Prevacox, it didn't work, I don't care, I don't like you. Is that their fault or is that yours? Is it yours? Correct medication regime. Now, the difference between my slide and the nurse's slide was that that was up high. What I want to say here is that the correct medication regime, early days, may be no medication. But it has to be correct. It has to be the correct regime. So this is where you start. Do they need medication? If they do, get it right. Then the next stage you can worry about. Correct body weight, body weight, diet and exercise. Avoid that sedentary lifestyle. So once you've done this, you can move to this. Physical therapy and environment. If the dog is the right weight, it's on the right medication, it's struggling, sort out the house. Now, to be honest, these should all really be done almost in the first consult, in that order. Even if you don't achieve it, you're going to get the dog the right weight in the same consult. That would be awesome. You'd be rich doing that for other people. Here we go. Then I would say, now, if you've got all this sorted out, oh, I want to do something else, put it on that, that one. Still, what do we talk about next? into articular therapies. If they come and say, oh, should I have stem cell therapy for my dog? Oh, your dog's obese. No, not yet, no. We'll talk about that at a later date. Get your dog to the right weight. Put the rubber mat down so he's not slipping on the floor when he's trying to eat. Do it in this order. And right at the top, other nutraceuticals. Should I give turmeric or should I give Boswellia? Hang on, hang on. Let's do this, okay? So essentially, that is my arthritis consult. Um, once you're standing on the top, happy with yourself, then you can go for a curry with your dog. But essentially, what I, th I was thinking of this, like, you know, with the cyclists, and they were doing this um, benefit of marginal gains. So doing little bits. This is what arthritis is about. Do the big things first, and then add the little bits on top. So in terms of cycling, this is making sure your bike has the right gear ratio. This is when you're checking that you can ride without stabilizers. And this is if you're worrying, will shaving my leg hair improve my personal best? There is no point stealing your wife's IMAC until your dad's taken your stabilizers off. <laughs> this is probably why kids don't have leg hair. So look, this is it. If you could take one photo, feel free. That's the way I do it. So I don't get tangled up in these discussions over turmeric and the like. I will talk to you about that once this is all correct. That's the order I do it in. So, early diagnosis. Find the cause, because there's got to be a cause. And if we can do something about the cause, we're going to save ourselves a lot of pain. Owner education, <coughs> give good and confident advice. And this is what we're trying to do with this uh, expertise panel. We're trying to, you'll, you'll hear about more, more about this this year. We want to give GPs good, confident framework. So like you know, when a dog comes in with Cushing's, there's no messing about. You guys diagnose it, you look at the instructions, do this, do this, do the blood test there, blah, blah, blah. Confident advice. We want that for arthritis. So you guys don't have to worry. Because I know when people are giving advice, say against someone who's talking about turmeric or something like that, they're thinking, oh God, you know, well, may, I don't know, maybe they're desperately worried they're going to say something wrong that they can be proven against. And I think part of the reason that, um, you know, we're, we're not confident about this is things like, you know, the, the Pentree study. You all, because this, this is really important to us. Have you heard about the Pentree study? No, but you look scared. There's no Pentree study. But when someone says this to you, you think, oh shit, I'm a, the worst vet in the world. Don't worry. We want to give you confident advice. And that's what the owners want. They just want someone to say, I know what I'm talking about. I recommend this. I recommend this. They like that. Multimodal treatment. Make sure it's working. If it's not, it doesn't mean you're a bad vet. It means you need to tweak the treatment. It's not your treatment that's wrong. It's the disease has progressed. Manage the environment. Good grip on the floors. Don't let them jump in and out of the car. Good trick. I don't know if my house is OK for my arthritic dog. Really, follow him on all fours. Follow him. <laughs> he doesn't like to jump in the car, but he jumps out all right. Yeah, have you ever tried jumping out of a car slowly? Onto your hands? No. Make them think, and then they just raise their awareness, and they see the dog through the dog's eyes. And change your plan as the disease changes. It's got to change because the disease changes. And engage the client. Make sure that you're on one team. And this really is what we started being vets for. You know, I do cool surgery, but in all honesty, over my career, all these cool surgeries, they're nothing compared to the benefit to these animals that I achieve through giving them arthritis care. And I started doing that 
day one out of college. This is something we can all do, and it makes a massive impact. You're taking dogs in pain, you're making them happy, reducing their pain, making them live longer in a happy state. And why do we have dogs? To make us happy. You're making the client happy. That is so cool. It is magic. So we can go out and make a massive difference. This is what we want. <laughs> OK. Right. Now, go and get more free tap from downstairs. Your kids' stockings won't fill themselves. Look here. <laughs> happy face, happy kid, Elanco teddy bear. This one, super happy, because I told her she's been a good girl, so she'll get that big girl's authentic lanyard and badge combo that she always wanted. <laughs> Ages three and up, suits a kid called McClement. Happy days. Any questions if we've got time? Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you.